purebred American superbike, what should he be like? A sleek, longitudinal engine with three camshafts and two crankshafts, a front fork on linear bearings, an electro-hydraulic slip clutch, and a meticulously designed narrow silhouette of the motorcycle. Actually, his back wheel was broader than his motor. At the very least, it ought to be uncommon and theoretically groundbreaking. And you'll learn about how things turned out in practice in today's unique story, For the overwhelming majority of enthusiasts, dreams of creating something new on two wheels still remain ephemeral. But there are such self-taught people who have crazy ideas, energy, and somehow manage to find money for all this. In the early 90s, John Britton and Andrea Cartanza's stardom soared. Recall the Elf projects? Desperados made giants follow, sporty Hondas or Ducatis with single-sided swing arm following Elf Decatanz's lead, or Benelli Tornado with tail radiators, like John Britton's motorcycles, exemplify their influence. The new century gave us another madman, the 40-year-old American architect Michael Sis. His workshop fulfilled orders for the most prestigious hotels and entertainment centers, and superstars live in the houses he designed. But Michael never forgot about the family hobby, motorcycles. Grandpa Clarence was famous as a tuner of Norton Manx racing motorcycles after World War II. Far Terry raced himself, prepped cars for others. Michael, on break from architecture, earned US championship points on a 250cc Aprilia RSV. His passion for bikes was instilled in him from an early age. At around four, a mini bike named Sears entered his life. Numerous older girls possessed this. Even at such a young age, Michael already had his own perspective on design. I even aesthetically despised him at that time. I desired an actual insect on the top in a genuine seat, he states. Being older, he rode motorcycles before falling in love with his dream of building a truly American, original, patented motorcycle for MotoGP participation, filled with advanced technologies. It would seem like an impossible task for a person without an engineering background. But you will be greatly surprised when you find out who created Michael's mind. Motosis, Michael's company, started as caricatured as it may sound in his own garage. The motorbike was designed and built, except for the fairings, for an extended period of time right there. And the computer's here, and the uh, C1 was here. The engine was built on that desk. The mule engine set in the corner, and we had a uh, drill press and a milling machine and just a few items. Seeing his son's intention to create the most unusual motorcycle, a racing motorcycle, Michael's father joined the team as the chief engineer. Knowing all the dangers of this sport, Terry wanted to protect her son. Together they assembled a team of excellent engineers and moved from their own garage to headquarters in Portland. They start implementing Caesar Jr.'s brilliant ideas. Michael has received over 30 patents for his project. And now it's time to see where his fanaticism has taken him. The basis is an inline four-cylinder engine with longitudinal arrangement naturally with liquid cooling, but it is only formally inline. The PPE itself refers to it as Z-shaped, as the cylinders in this engine are arranged in a zigzag, or more simply, in a chess order. Just like on the Fulvia V4 or the more well-known variant from the Volkswagen Group, the VR6 engine. Furthermore, PPE prototype has 15 degree cylinder misalignment with German. But similarities end there, from top to bottom, in order. To begin with, Michael's engine has three camshafts, because the throttle intake passes between them in an unusual way, which makes the cylinder head slightly wider, similar to VR6. But it is not four camshafts, like on V-shaped 60, 90 degree fours, which is a direct weight saving and a very simple solution. Timing belt, drive gear, as well as the block, no longer looked solid, but like two connected parallel twines. Michael asserted that this cylinder arrangement enhanced engine cooling. 
Moving down, we encounter a crankshaft divided in half. Two of its halves rotate in opposite directions, thereby being the main feature, neutralizing the gyroscopic effect of the engine. The main focus was on this during the tech presentation, and it worked, but more on that later. The leading gear on the right crankshaft is smaller than on the left one because its power must pass through an intermediate shaft to change its direction before both crankshafts transmit torque to the gearbox. The six-speed transmission is located directly under the engine and is an easily removable unit for quick gear ratio changes necessary for racing. It took about 10 minutes, not hours. He was equipped with the world's first slipping hydroelectric clutch. The element was controlled by electronics and activated by hydraulics. It was located directly in the airflow, providing improved cooling. The Z-shaped engine of the Saizo was compact, just 16.5 cm wide, enabling a larger motorcycle than competitors, yet free from gyroscopic forces, providing a unique advantage. Engine parts made by Cosworth. To achieve narrow silhouette from front, two small radiators installed, main third one located under seat, this one produced by well-known company Cosworth. And also a rather interesting moment. The hypothesis was that a small frontal area signifies a higher and maximum velocity for a given output power. With increased speed, high pressure air is directed to the back of the bike and the radiator. A smaller aerodynamic bag behind the motorcycle, enabling effective overtaking on straightaways with a slim silhouette compensating for power deficit due to sudden regulations, for example. The rear wheel was wider than the engine. It may seem like science fiction, but this prototype is not unique solely because of the engine's size. Instead of the typical inverted fork, the so-called 6X-Flex system is installed here. It seems like you're holding the front wheel axle straight with your hands, Feel the slightest inclination of the wheel, the tire grip, and the limits of sliding in a high-speed turn. The merit of linear bearings, greatly reducing friction and thereby increasing fork sensitivity. You can brake very late with her when entering a turn, and press the brake lever with all your might while passing the corner. This solution has a positive impact on the speed of its replacement. Finally, with this solution there is no such concept as cavitation of damping oil. The lower part of the system is designed in such a way as to provide maximum rigidity in the vertical and horizontal directions, but at the same time have elasticity in the lateral directions in order to absorb shocks during turns. The rear aluminum swing arm was welded from six parts initially. At that point there were already two damping elements. Reverse. This solution aided in fine-tuning the rear suspension more accurately. The frame, fairings, wheels, tank, and in final versions, swing arm, were all made of carbon. After a series of failures that haunted the team throughout the development process, which is normal for such practice, in the end, in 2006, the engine came to life. Having assembled the motorcycle completely, Motosys immediately proceeded to the tests. Michael and his team had to design and manufacture more than 1,000 individual parts to build SI-1. The first, let's say, witnesses of the creation of CISA were amazed by its uniqueness. The wow effect was off the charts. So nice to see a, a, fresh, a fresh mind like his. And... It's kind of like this. Michael, ballsiest move I've ever seen, man. <laughs> Two handsome gray and black went on their first track tests. Without having a whole team of employees, resources and capabilities available to larger players, Michael's team had only these two working instances. A couple of failures in the very first tests greatly undermined the team's morale, which was already low due to overall fatigue and financial problems. MotoGP rider Jeremy McWilliams agreed to test E1 first. And the first feelings from, from your bike is that there is no effort required to go from left to right. You could go as fast as you needed to change direction. 
None of us have ever ridden a bike with that configuration, you know, that I want to ride it again. AMA champion Shane Turpin. I don't know where to begin. Um, I had so much going through my head because there were so many things that I was, holy shit, that's awesome, that's awesome, you know? Braking, accelerating, uh, the shifter, I mean, everything about it is, you gotta learn how to ride this thing in the turns because it's, it's not a motorcycle, it's so different. In riding, you don't understand. You physically, nobody understands. The suspension is, is uh, you felt everything that was going on that you needed to feel as a rider. So it turns out that all these space technologies were working. The word of the racers, although it looks like a marketing move, but we have no other way to check or refute it. Objectively, the perfect story of a flawless American superbike. That's exactly how it should have been. Born in a country of liberal views and fresh ideas, he was a new word in the two-wheeled history. And this is how Americans do it. You know, this bike has got the bones of a champion, but it's up to us to put the muscles on it. But I couldn't take C1 to the gym. The changed MotoGP rules have reduced the engine displacement to 800cc. They started to develop 18000 revolutions per minute, and this is already the territory of a pneumatic valve. And there was neither the strength nor the finances to remake the engine for this volume. And Moto Assist C1 failed. The superbike situation also proved to be annoying. To take part, the manufacturer had to sell 150 units of combined equipment. To address the MotoGP situation, Michael opted to sell his superbike for the starting price of $55k, thereby recovering the investments at least partially. Later, the superbike regulations changed. Now it was necessary to sell 1,500 units of equipment, and this was the last straw for the team's patience. And that's how the Motosys C1 story ended. Motosys now succeeds in transitioning to electric motorcycles successfully. Like his hero John Britton, Michael was a radical revisionist, a self-taught engineer capable of breaking the stereotypes of two-wheeled design traditions in favor of creating something completely unique and technically innovative. He really was a motorcyclist, a man not ready to compromise.